Okay. Well, uh, good evening to all of you. Um, welcome to this book launch, to this webinar, to this seminar. Uh, my name is Gad Human. I'm one of the organizers uh, of the seminar, along with Kate Quinn and Steve Cushion. And it's indeed a great personal pleasure to welcome Ada Ferrer uh, to our, our seminar this evening, or for her this afternoon. Ada is the Julius Silver Professor uh, of History and Latin American Caribbean Studies at NYU, uh, New York University. She has won numerous prizes for her work, including the very prestigious Frederick Douglass Book Prize for her book, Freedom's Mirror, Cuba and Haiti in the Age of Revolution. And this evening, we're very pleased to launch her new book, Cuba and American History. I might remind you all of our procedures. Uh, Ada will give her presentation and then we will open the floor for questions. So I hope you will be saving up your questions during her talk. And of course, uh, I'm sure you're by now all familiar with the fact that you can put your questions in the chat or raise your hand under the button labeled reactions. So Ada, over to you. Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Gad. And, um and Kate for, for hosting me. Sorry, I'm just, um, just uh, and thanks all to being here. This, I, know, I mean, at least in the US, this is a very, very busy time of the semester. Um, I assume it is for you as well. So thanks for, for taking the time to do this. So I'm here today to just talk informally about my, my new book, which as Gad said, is called Cuba and American History. And it's a very different kind of book than I've done before in that it's, um, it's a trade book. It's not an academic monograph. It, it, it's not especially aimed at making a historiographical uh, contribution. Um, at the same time, it's not a textbook. And um, yeah, and while it draws and builds on and, and, and uses the rich and pathbreaking work of many of my colleagues, some of you here uh, in this uh, virtual room, uh, the emphasis is really on, um, on narrative and on accessibility and making the history of Cuba uh, available and accessible to a wide, a wide audience. And so I just want to talk a little bit about what, um, what the book is and a little bit about how I went about writing it and what I tried to um, accomplish with it. And I'll, and I'll draw on some specific examples from the, from the book, paraphrasing, not, not reading or anything. Okay. So basically, you know, at a basic, at its most basic level, uh, the book is, uh, his, is a history of Cuba, uh, a character an episode-driven history of Cuba narrated over uh, more than 500 years. And I think of it as a book or a history that's that's reconceived and written for, for this moment, which I see as a moment in which history itself is up for grabs. And I think it's been up for grabs for, uh, for, for a little bit, but perhaps especially now, and several things have contributed to that. One, the passing uh, of Fidel Castro uh, from this world, the passing of Raul Castro from power, um, with both of which I think invite, um, raise urgent questions and invite um, his, you know, new historical analysis about the meanings and the legacies of the Cuban revolution. Then in terms of the US and Cuba, obviously Barack Obama's opening, then the closing by, by Trump, and then the election of, of Biden, which so far has not made uh, much of a difference uh, in terms of US-Cuba policy, you know, th that does the same thing. Finally, in Cuba itself, the protests that we saw, that we've seen, um, you know, going back um, to November of last year, and especially through the summer uh, of this year, also raise um, questions, you know, about about the present, about the future, but also about how we reckon with the history of, of the Cuban uh, revolution. So what I want to talk today is a little bit of how I tried to write for what I see as this as this moment of reckoning. So uh, let me begin by saying, obviously, I mean, I, I don't know where you're where you're logging in from, but the event is hosted by UCL and you know in London. But the 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 book, you know, written in English, published in the United States, uh, I see its primary audience uh, 
as, consi as consisting of, of mostly, um, not mostly, but, 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 but the majority way of, of Americans with very little knowledge of the island's history and with all kinds of, and with whatever they know overdetermined by, by myth and caricature. So I wanted to write the book to challenge America or to challenge Americans rather to see Cuba beyond those myths. Uh, beyond Fidel uh, and beyond Fidel Castro and, and going back over a much longer period of time. I think for me, it was really important that though the book is primarily conceived of as a history of Cuba, that I wanted it also to function as a kind of selective and necessarily incomplete history of the US. Right, that the US has played such a large role in Cuban history that to study Cuban history, I think, is also to see the US from the outside in, to, to understand US history from Cuban ground and Cuban waters, right? So I say um, that I sometimes imagined the book as a kind of shadow history uh, of the US. One that in the first instance prompted American readers to think anew about Cuba, but in the second also invites readers to think anew and also maybe askew uh, about, about the US itself. Uh, so, that, so, so that part of the book was also very important to me, right? Giving American readers uh, a view of their own country through the eyes of another. Now, how do I do that? How do I uh, how do I actually, you know, uh, accomplish or try to accomplish that goal in, in the organization of the book and the writing? And part of what I do throughout is to go back and forth a lot between uh, the two countries, though, of course, Cuba gets um, you know, exponentially more attention than the U.S., right? But I, I, I did this thing where some chapters begin in Cuba, others begin in the U.S., and many of the chapters include to one, ex you know, include, um, often include both, uh, both places. And the purpose of that back and forth was not to compare, it's not at all a comparative history, but what I wanted to do is to tell interconnected overlapping stories uh, to allow readers to glimpse how different history can seem depending on where they're standing. Right, so history looks different depending, and and, and as a, as many of us as historians will know, this history looks very different depending on our on our vantage point. And often I play in the book with readers' perspectives and expectations right from the start of each chapter. And so my point, is, so so I didn't, you know, many chapters start with a story, though it's not a random, you know, it's not a random anecdote that I begin with. Uh, often it's the central narrative, but but written uh, in a narrative way that maybe tries to surprise the reader. But my point was not just to surprise the reader for surprise sake, but rather to draw their attention to things that don't easily fit into categories, right? To things that might often be at the edge of the frame. So many, not all, <clears throat> it didn't always work, but uh, many of the chapter openings uh, try to encompass things that are both, that will be both familiar and unfamiliar to the reader. And I do that, I think, to create, or I wanted to create a space of welcome for readers in the chapters, but also, you know, a space perhaps of slight discomfort. Uh, that might lead them, you know, where they where they see from the start that you know something will be a little uh, disturbed, uh, perhaps by by their reading. And so I'm going to give you some examples of how I did that for some of the specific content in the book. Okay, and then and then I'll wrap up. So I'm going to talk about a few of the uh, of the chapters. And the first one that I want to talk a little bit about is chapter one itself, uh, which begins. Though then it goes back in time, but it begins. Uh, with the arrival of Columbus um, in the New World in 1492. And of course, that's a history that's very, very familiar. It's familiar not just to, to, to people who know Cuban history, but to American readers uh, in general, right? It's a, it's a staple of, of what uh, people call here um, elementary school social studies, right? That Columbus's landing begins almost uh, every general um, history of the U.S. from the very first uh, volume of George Bancroft's History of the United States, which was published in 1834, to Howard Zinn's A People's History of the US, published in 1980, and to Jill Lepore's much more recent book, 
uh, these truths. So I begin the chapter with that very familiar story, but I right away make um, a simple observation, and that is that Columbus never ever set foot on any, on any territory that became part of the United States. And that simple observation then raises a question. Why is it that a history that did not occur in the US or in any of the territories that eventually became the US came to serve as the obligatory origin point of US history? And what I discuss is that actually the conception of US history as originating in 1492 actually emerged in the 19th century. And it emerged precisely at the moment when American statesmen began to imagine the a young United States expanding into places like Cuba and the Caribbean. So what I what I show is, or what I suggest, because I don't spend that much time on it, right? What I suggest is that early US historians seized an essentially foreign history and made it theirs. Many of them fully expecting that the lands on which that history unfolded would soon be theirs too. So today, Americans, you know, they, they're completely familiar with the old, that old history of Columbus's arrival, but most Americans are generally unaware of the later history of empire that led that Columbus story to being narrated as their own. So here, that's an example, and that's, you know, again, what I try to do throughout of a chapter opening that begins with something very familiar, but in a way that calls unexpected attention to Americans' understanding of, of their own history. Okay, so now I wanna jump a, a, a few centuries forward and, and talk briefly about one of the 19th century chapters that deals with the question of slavery. There are several chapters, most of the 19th century chapters in one way or another deal with the question of, of slavery. But there's one, um, chapter nine, uh, which begins uh, in the US uh, with the inauguration of a US vice president, I'm sorry, of a US president in uh, March of 1953. It's the inauguration of, of Franklin uh, Pierce. So I begin that chapter in Washington, DC uh, with, this, with the, you know, the, the story of that inauguration, the snow falling, the fact that Franklin Pierce is incredibly depressed because his son died, all, you know, all this stuff, uh, that there's protesters, that there's you know, looming sectional conflict. There's also a missing uh, vice president. Uh, William Rufus King. And uh, William Rufus King, um, at the moment of the inauguration, is actually in Cuba on a Cuban sugar plantation. And he is the only um, American vice president uh, to have ever taken his oath of office as U.S. vice president on foreign ground. So um, he was dying of tuberculosis, um, taking something that doctors at the time called the sugar cure, where people were supposed to go to an active sugar mill and, and, and breathe in all the fumes as enslaved people were uh, processing and, and, and carting and hauling and um, uh, sugar and uh, breathing all that, breathing all those fumes and sitting in the heat was supposed to cure his case of tuberculosis. It obviously didn't. But, um, but that's, you know, when I read that story that, um, which comes up in passing in, in, in a lot of work, but I've never really focused on it before. But I chose to start um, that chapter on slavery with that American inauguration with the vice president sitting on a Cuban sugar plantation because, you know, not as a way to, to not focus on, on, on the enslaved in Cuba or, uh, um, you know, who, who appear in other parts of the chapter and other chapters, obviously, but as a way to call attention to the way that the U.S. itself was so deeply implicated in the day-to-day -day functioning of Cuban slavery and the ways in which Cuban slavery was deeply uh, connected to American attempts at expansion uh, into, um, into Cuba, right? So that's um, another example, you know, I, I just wanted to, that's one of my favorite chapters and I just wanted to give it as an example of, of, of the way I kind of move back and forth and um, yeah, and just tell people or tell, you know, 
present to American readers, not just things they, they're not going to know about Cuba, but things they're not going to know about, about the US um, as well. Okay, now I want to jump to a very different um, section of the book. And as you might imagine, that, that section is um, the section on the, on, the Cuban, on the Cuban Revolution. And um, in some ways, I felt, I feel like every challenge related to the book is, is greater for the period of the Cuban Revolution because uh, it's, the, it's the part of the history that people are, are most familiar with on some level. They also may have the most uh, misconceptions about. They also may have the, the strongest opinions about. So I feel like the challenge of, of, of writing and getting people to kind of um, maybe suspend judgment or just you know not immediately fall back on what they think they know I felt the, the, the burden of uh, you know of that most keenly uh, in the in the section of the of the book on the revolution which is which is you know more than a third close to more than a third of the book um, okay and so I want to um, talk a little bit about um, a couple of the chapters and and the way I do that, and I'm just bringing up these chapters just you know in it sometimes when I've done when I've presented the book at, at things like book fairs I'll do um, you know I do a, a short reading from some of these chapters, but I'm, I don't I don't want to do that uh, with this format. But you know feel free to ask me more about these chapters or about obviously about any of any other potential section of the book that you, that you might want to talk about. But um, there's two chapters in particular on the revolution that I want to talk about here, and that is uh, the the two chapters that that um, again that that readers most familiar with overarching histories of the Cold War would be most familiar with, and that is of course that you know uh, I have a chapter on on the Bay of Pigs and a chapter on on the Cuban on the Cuban Missile Crisis, and um, I'm going to talk about them, I think, out of out of order uh, and talk about the missile crisis, um, the missile crisis chapter first. Now that, you know, that's a subject, again, that many readers are familiar with. There's there's mainstream movies about it. There's you know, been dozens and dozens of books, uh, you know, trade books, commercial books that 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 people um, are, you know, might be familiar with. So. And often the way that is narrated is as the, you know, the history of the 13 days, the history of a history that begins when um, Kennedy becomes aware of, of, the so of Soviet missiles in Cuba, right? And then the history is narrated, the, 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 um, the tension and the, 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 the almost come, and the coming to the precipice of, of nuclear war uh, and then the resolution. And it's a story that's primarily focused on Kennedy, on Khrushchev, and sometimes also on, on Fidel Castro. So the way I, I begin um, that chapter is, um, is different. So I start, uh, you know, I, I started in Cuba and I started in a small rural town called Santa Cruz de los Pinos. And um, it's actually less than uh, two miles from where, where my mother grew up, which is something I just figured out when I was working on all this. But in 1962, people there still got around mostly on horseback, horse-drawn carriage. There were, you know, occasional station wagons that picked up riders for modest fare. But in September of 1962, uh, and this is how, you know, I opened the chapter, the town suddenly began having traffic jams in the middle of the night. There were these massive trucks that, that, that came in, and they were so big that they shook the ground, and they tried to make it around the corners in the small town and they, the, the, the truck's turns were too wide. Uh, you know, police had to, um, and local military had to um, take down the columns on the building, on the spot. They had to demolish uh, a, a, a restaurant that, that stood in the way. Uh, people came to their windows to figure out what was happening and Cuban soldiers motioned for the residents to step inside. 
and away from their windows. And as you know, and, and the way I start is with that episode. And I have Cuban people doing what, you know, what I learned in my research that they were doing, which is that they, you know, if you, those of you who know Cuban architect or Caribbean architect will know that many windows are those wooden louvered windows. And there's accounts of people, you know, of people opening those, those slats to try to, look out and figure out, you know, what in the world was going on. And what they saw was these, you know, the, these big trucks that had um, these long, um, long beds in the back, you know, these long uh, platforms. And on those platforms, uh, there were these things covered in tarps uh, that looked like large palm trees. So, of course, they weren't large palm trees. They were these, you know, uh, Soviet R-12 missiles, uh, each with a range of about 1,200 uh, miles, easily able to uh, strike the U.S. Um, eastern seaboard, and uh, each potentially, you know, capable of carrying a nuclear warhead, uh, 70 times more powerful than, than what the U.S. had detonated over Hiroshima. So, so that's how I begin that chapter. And of course, later I go on to narrate the traditional 13 day crisis, but I do so within a frame that also includes Cuban men and women. So people living near the bases, striking up friendships with, and courtships even with those Soviet soldiers, trading with them um, and so on, and trying to kind of just understand what was happening uh, to, their, to their world um, at that moment, okay? By the end of that chapter, uh, with nuclear war averted, as we all know, I briefly discuss the impact of the well-known episode of the, you know, of the missile crisis for both um, the U.S. And the, and the Soviet Union. But I, you know, I suggest that for Cuba itself, having survived uh, that, that, that crisis, the, the long-term impact uh, was not particularly great. And I explain why, and then I end the chapter uh, with pigs, because uh, when the Cuban, when the Soviets left, Cubans uh, did what 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 Cubans um, um, have done so well, which is they, um, you know, they they recycle. So they they snuck into the Cuban uh, the Soviet missile hangars and gathered what material they could that had been left behind. And then they used some of those materials in their own, um, you know, in their own property. And they used it to, as material in, um, to make pig, pig pens and animal pens, you know, for other, uh, for other livestock and, and such. So that's, uh, again, you know, the, the idea is that you take this large, this history with a big age of the Cold War, but but focus it or not focus it entirely but you make you make room for ordinary cubans who live that um history day to day okay and then speaking of pigs the last chapter i want to discuss here is the ch my chapter on the bay of pigs um it was the you know anyway yeah uh as 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 many of you may know the most common accounts of the history of the bay of pigs in cuba begins with the landing of uh, the U.S. orchestrated invasion of anti-Castro exiles, okay, uh, in the in the swamps of the of the Bay of Pigs. So my Bay of Pigs chapter uh, begins in that swamp as well, but I begin it differently. So I begin by discussing um, the, the the unusual landscape, and it's actually uh, remarkably stable and unchanging uh, landscape um, for eons. So there are, um, there are species that are considered so unchanging over so long that scientists sometimes refer to them as living fossils because they change so little. Uh, one, of those, uh, one of those species, those old species in the area is called the queen triggerfish, which Cubans call cochinos, which is how um, the Bay of Pigs got its name, um, Bahia de Cochinos or, or Bay of Pigs. And so I discuss, you know, I discuss the, the, the longevity of some of those um, species and so on. And then I, I bring in, and this is all brief, condensed, right? But I bring in uh, human, human actors as, as latecomers. Uh, so I, I refer to um, the indigenous people who lived in the area who used to bury their dead 
feet always facing to the east under layers of soil and snail shells. I talk about captive Africans who were in, during the illegal slave trade uh, were landed on those um, unwelcoming, uh, dangerous coasts and had to navigate the coral reefs uh, in, in bare feet. I talk about the coal workers who uh, for generations have made a living uh, in, the only, in the only industry in the area, which was, which was coal. They would, they would harvest the, 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 the trees from under the swamp, uh, you know, excavate them with the weight of their own bodies, among other things, and then create these pits and burn them to create charcoal. And that was the main industry in the region uh, before, you know, the, the, the invasion happened. And then I go to the period of the early revolution and some of the projects that the revolutionary government had undertaken there. And the fact that, which I didn't know until I started doing this research, I learned a lot doing the research, even though I thought I already knew a lot. But uh, one of the things I found is that Fidel Castro spent his first Christmas in power, you know, in the area having Christmas Eve dinner with uh, with resident charcoal workers. He showed up by surprise, brought like a pig and a half and beer and soda and invited himself to Christmas uh, Eve dinner. So I, I begin with all that and then the invasion happens and we all know that, of course about the you know the failure of the invasion and and I and and I it's, you know, I've worked through many, many state uh, state departments, CIA, uh, executive branch governments, trying to figure out how the American failure um, unfolded. But by beginning um, in the swamp with Cuban geography, with Cuban history, with uh, actual residents of the area, their experience going back, gener you know, generations and centuries, but even in the first two years of revolution. I remind the reader, or I, or I emphasize to the reader, that any discussion of the U.S. failure uh, at the Bay of Pigs has to encompass all that, right? No landing, no invasion ever occurs on a blank slate, or in this case, more literally, an empty beach, right? History cannot be willed away. And, and so, um, and so that's what I try to do uh, with the opening of, of that chapter and really with the whole book, right? That you can't think about, you know, Cuba-US policy or the, uh, the Cuban revolution or the Cuban, um, or, or the future of the, the Cuban government or the Cuban people without, you know, by willing away um, history. So we have to confront it and, and reckon with it. Now, if it's true that um, the, that American military planners um, in um, you know during the Bay of Pigs could not will away history, it's also true that Cubans can't will away history either. So I want to shift gears a little in this final part of the presentation and address the question of how I see the book addressing not just um, Cuban readers. I'm sorry, American readers, but also Cuban readers, Cuban American readers, and international readers from from other parts of the world? How might, how, how might the book uh, speak to them? And so in terms of Cuban readers, I was really clear that I wanted to provide a new kind of synthesis, right? A new synth, you know, that it's a history of Cuba over more than five centuries, that, you know, so there will be the kinds of epic sweeping episodes and uh, stories. There will be uh, larger than life figures like Columbus or Castro or Mati or Maceo and so on. Right, but I but I was clear that I wanted them to appear that if they were going to appear, and I knew they had to, that they would appear alongside people whose names um, we often do not know. Right, so the people whose whose lives were buffeted uh, by Big H history, but that are not often uh, included in uh, in Big H history. So these might be like. Uh, the enslaved men and women, right, who who had to walk barefoot through those same uh, coral reefs that that the American invaders uh, had to navigate. It might include um, enslaved men and women, you know, who in their in their quarters at night um, on a plantation owned by a U.S. senator um, had to use the light of glowworms as candles. Okay. 
It might include people launching a raft from the Malecon in the 1990s or going there to see off others. Even when I can't know what those people were thinking, uh, much less feeling, I, I, I knew that in this synthesis, I wanted to place them in the narrative to make sure that readers knew that this is their history too, right? That it is a, a narrative history in which ordinary people might recognize themselves and might recognize each other. So I, you know, as my editor was talking about epic history, I kept coming back to the idea of epic history on a, on a human scale, okay? Uh, and I think that that scale does something else too. I think, I hope that it helps resist the urge to tell or read history from a, only or mostly from a perspective of, of hindsight. Some of that, of course, is inevitable. We all know what's going to happen, right? As we're writing, we know what comes next. But I try to construct a contingent account to narrate it as much as possible in a way that forestalls the outcome, in a way that comes closer to capturing the experience of people living through history day to day. And I think that's especially important for the parts of the book that deal with the post-1952 and perhaps especially the post-1959 period. Uh, one of the things I do also in writing about the revolution is to shift the language a bit. So uh, I never use the phrase, the triumph of the revolution. This is a standard way that the revolution has spoken, that the revolution always spoke about itself. It's a standard phrase in Cuban scholarship, in Cuban journalism, in, Cuban, in everyday life. You even see it sometimes among exile writers who were formed uh, within, uh, within Cuba and left afterwards. But um, I never use it because for me to say that the revolution triumphed in 1959 assumes that the revolution was already fully formed, a singular entity already defined, and it igno ignores all the deep-seated conflicts that unfolded after Batista fled, uh, right? All the, all the conflicts to give it meaning and to determine its character. So um, we all know that what the revolution became was not what it was uh, in January, 1959. So throughout, I try to restore that sense of uncertainty, disrupting the frames that assume that we can speak of 62 years of anything. For the government in Havana, it's 62 years of revolution, of struggle, of resistance. For the government's opponents, it's 62 years of dictatorship. I think both perspectives are profoundly ahistorical. They ignore the fact that time never stands still, that Cuba in 1959 is not the same thing as in 1976 or 80 or 1994, much less uh, 2021. So in the end, by writing this history as history, right, human, contingent, sometimes surprising, sometimes heartbreaking. I think that what I'm really, or what I'm trying to do, right, in the only way that I know how to do it, is to imagine a future that, that might be built on, on a foundation of, of mutual recognition. So I think if the book invites American readers to see their own country, the US, from the eyes of another, I think it urges Cuban readers to see their own past through the eyes of each other, right? And so that's what I tried to do. Since, um, so I was gonna end there, but then I thought since, since or maybe we can raise this for questions. I'll, actually, I'll just end there because I see Gad's, Gad's face. So I will end there. I've been talking for- <laughs> No, no, I only, I think you minutes. should tell your, your final story. No, I only, that's okay. Uh, no, thought you were no, I'll let, Anyway, I'll that was, that, there'll be, I hope, an opportunity for you to do so. Anyway, that was really interesting and really interesting also from a kind of, from really an historian's perspective, which I think is particularly interesting. I mean, I particularly like, they're all, all of it I like, but the, you know, the Bay of Pigs and the history of the beach, that's just great. Yeah. Um, so there are, there are tons of questions I have, I assume others will. I will just uh, ask a question, which I suspect, I, I expect a lot of questions would arise out of the revolution and out of your discussion of that, which is a lot to, to think about, but a little kind of anecdotal point, one which I certainly hadn't heard about, is the story that you started off with, sort of at the earlier part of Rufus King. Yeah, and uh, there he is, as you describe him. And I wondered if that, if you th you saw that as a sort of anecdotal or accidental, or indeed, uh, does it have a wider significance that there he is? Uh, 
trying to solve his health problem, but yeah, raising larger issues. Yeah. So um, there was a debate on Twitter today about the virtues and and uh, perils of beginning of, of of using anecdotes to begin history books or proposals or chapters. So. Um, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule either way. So I started with that with that story because to me, well, for one thing, it's completely surprising and unexpected. When mm -hmm. I read it, um, uh, I just did a double take. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. You know, I had to reread. Wait, the vice president took his oath of office on a Cuban sugar plantation. Wait, the U.S. vice president, and you had to reread. And then, of course, I went down the rabbit hole, finding everything I could about him and the plantation and who was there and the, the witness accounts, etc. So one one is that that it's that you know it's so I liked it for that reason, but also it just was so it, it's not just an anecdote for the sake of an anecdote, as, as your question suggests. It's it it's the perfect way to illustrate and embody, you know, and, and like make tangible and concrete and material these, the, the connections between uh, the, U the U.S. system of slavery and the Cuban system of slavery. You know, William Rufus King was not only vice president, he was also, you know, an Alabama slaveholder and planter. He was deeply familiar with the institution of slavery. For him, like, you know, sugar may have been a new crop to him, but the idea of, 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 of being in a, on a modern plantation certainly wasn't. The idea of being surrounded by uh, enslaved people certainly wasn't. Uh, so that's one way, right, that it, it, it stresses the, the, the parallels and the similarities there. The other thing is that, um, you know, that the, the tick he won on a ticket was Franklin Pierce, part of which, uh, part of the platform was specifically acquiring Cuba and annexing it to the U.S. So one of the mottos for the campaign was Pierce in Cuba. And there were people at that inauguration carrying that sign, Pierce in Cuba. So in some ways, if you, th you know, one way I like to think about him taking the, the oath of office on, you know, on this plantation in Matanzas, that in some ways he was marking Cuban, he was marking Cuba as imminent American territory. You know, and that's I think how how many people. I mean, he was there supposedly to get better. He didn't, but but I think that's also another aspect of his presence there. And so it's you know it brings in it, it brings in the history of Cuban slavery, U.S. slavery. It ties together the history of both those slaveries with the history of U.S. empire and U.S. expansionism. So it's not just like an accidental cute anecdote. It's this like you know, it's like the perfect. It's the it's the perfect illustration of something, and I feel like sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes illustrations illustrations can clarify things as much as explication can sometimes. So, yeah. interesting, very good. Here's a, a question uh, in the chat from from Leah, who says, "Would you consider Cuba's political history as exceptional in comparison to other revolutions in the Caribbean?" What are your opinions on the disappointments of the promises? Oh, this is a big question. What are your opinions on the disappointments of the promises of the revolution in terms of eliminating racial inequality? Mm -hmm. yeah, we, only have, we only have a couple of hours, it's not a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, that's a, so. You know, I feel like the history of the Caribbean is full, it is, is, you know, You know the history of the, and this is a center. This is a this is a Caribbean history seminar, right, or a Caribbean studies seminar. I feel like so many of us who, who do Caribbean studies and Caribbean histories are used to, you know, and are and are we're you know we're we're formed and we're part of these debates about what made the Caribbean the Caribbean and what makes the Caribbean an area of study. Uh, you know, a coherent field of study, the history of the plantation, the history of colonialism. So we look for all these things that that unite these different Caribbean societies. At the yeah. same time, with all that unity there and all that coherence there, there's all these exceptional stories, right? So the Haitian Revolution is exceptional, right? There. <laughs> um, so I think if we were to ask the question, as you know, this as Leah does about whether uh, 
you know, the Cuban revolution is, ex is exceptional. Uh, I think the one, I think it really bears comparing it to, to the Haitian revolution, right? In the, in the same way that, that CLR James kind of pointed to in his append 63 appendix to the Black Jacobins, right? I think that there are a lot of parallels between those two revolutions that were uh, so far apart. So in terms of um, how radically they, they transformed uh, societies, even as there were some continuities, obviously, there always are, but um, it, um, so that that's one in terms of how it changed the, 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 um, the place of, of each respective island um, in the world, right? So there was, there was a, they were both ostracized by uh, powers that be in the world, right? So they, you know, the U.S. tried to isolate Cuba, just as you know, France and the Vatican and other places tried to isolate uh, Haiti, etc. So, so they both exerted enormous symbolic uh, and exemplary power way beyond their borders and way. Um, you know, at, at a level and at a proportion really surprising for the size of these places, right? Uh, so they both had kind of outsized influence in that way. So anyway, so I think that's really interesting. So I think they're, you know, so I don't think it's, so basically, is it exceptional? I don't know. I mean, is it, not entirely, you know? Um, and then the last question in terms of race, um, Yeah, I agree that uh, that race and racial inequality is a central issue. One of the things I, you know, and my my work before this was, you know, in some, was in my, you know, in both my my first book and my second book, questions about about slavery and and race um, and racism and anti racism were central questions. So I I couldn't agree more with that with that um, you know. With that statement, and I forgot where I was going, so I'm trying. I, I'm going to let you look at the chat yet. Yeah, okay, fine. So that's fine. That's yeah. fine. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my. And how, job oh, how would I? Yeah, I mean, I talk about that in the book. So there's, you know, about the the revolution and its relationship to, and what it did in terms of uh, of race and and racism on the island, uh, and other people have have worked on this. A lot. So in this part of the book, I built on the work of others, including Alejandro de la Fuente, um, Devin Spence Benson, you know, many others to show the way that um, that there were that there was real progress made in terms of some indicators like, you know, life expectancy, education, etc. The way that um, that underlying uh, the, the, well, the, the way that some of the, that even with those advances, uh, that was not enough to guarantee that there would be a real program of anti-racism and, and, and real progress. And everything we've seen since the special period in the 90s really uh, reminds us of that. So, Excellent. Start. Well, Pam basically agrees with you and says, as you can see in the chat, it's a very valid topic, should be explored as a central factor in the revolution and its aftermath. I think a, yeah. an interesting yeah. comment. Um, Freddie says, uh, in your view, can today's Cuban government claim to be taking forward Marti's legacy? That's another big question. Yeah, someone, uh, someone just sent me a photograph. There is a new uh, museum and research center that is that just opened or is about to open, I forget, in Havana, in Vidalo, which is a, like a Fidel Castro center that is going to be a library and a museum. Apparently, it's modern and posh and, you know, cost a fortune, I'm sure, to build. Uh, it's in the same building, same area as the Chinese embassy, so there's speculation about Chinese money, which would make uh, which would make sense, but apparently there's this portrait uh, that, you know, that metamorphosizes so that it's Mati and then it changes and then it becomes Fidel and then it becomes Mati. <laughs> so certainly uh, the Cuban government um, would like to, um, would like to make that, 
that claim. And Fidel Castro himself always, I mean, he didn't, he didn't make the claim in terms of himself, but he made the claim in terms of the revolution, the idea that the Cuban revolution of 1959 represented the culmination of the, of the, of the goals and aspirations of 19th century revolutionaries. I think that um, there, in terms, and that, you know, there is a point where that made sense in terms of um, questions of sovereignty and the island's relationship to the U.S. Uh, but in terms of, I forgot the way the I forgot the way the person phrased the question. But I think in terms of, uh, in ter you know, in other areas, so not speaking only about the Cuba-U.S. Uh, relationship, I don't. I cannot imagine a scenario in which um, Mati would have subordinated uh, essential rights of people in order to stand up to the US. So there's a famous letter that actually was, uh, that Fidel Castro himself quotes all the time, which is, um, the, you know, it's, a, it's, what, it's my second to last letter where he says uh, to a, a Mexican colleague, he says, I worry that, uh, that, that the US, that Cuba, sorry, in achieving its independence will create the space for the US to fall upon Cuba and then by extension, all of Latin America. So he worried that Cuban independence uh, might set the stage for American expansionism, might be worried about that. That that came to pass. But that worry about U.S. empire would have never led Marti not to advocate for Cuban independence. So I think there's a parallel there that I'm not, that I'm a little too tired to flesh out. But the, 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 my sense is that if, if Marti valued Cuban sovereignty, he also valued uh, the you know the rights um the rights of people to equality to to justice to um to you know different kinds of individual freedoms as well so yeah so i don't think yeah i'll just let it go. that's good that's great yeah. uh i'm sure our mutual friend manuel manuel garcia asks uh how do you think right. the book will be received in cuba you know, I don't know. I have no, I, I have no idea. Um, I mean, I'm hearing from some people reading it in Cuba, and they seem to be enjoying it. But they all wrote before they got to the part on the Cuban Revolution, so I don't. <laughs> and I haven't heard from them since, so um, so I'm not sure. But I think that actually, I think, you know, I think I think it'll be they're not going to agree with everything. I, don't, I think that's impossible, but I think that, um, I'm just hoping that people can realize that the book comes from a very uh, respectful human place. I'm trying to write history. I'm not trying to write, um, politics. I'm not trying to write uh, uh, a justification for, 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 the, for anyone. Um, I'm trying to write a history that takes Cuban people seriously and puts them at the center of the story, even as the U.S. is playing an enormous role here as well. So, uh, yeah, so I end the I end the chapter, I end the book with a, the epilogue is called If Monuments Could Speak. And it focuses on uh, a black sculptor um, who is, I'm just like blanking on it, Blanco, Blanco. Blanco is a second last name and I'm just like blanking on the name. Uh -huh. Because I've been doing I've been doing Zoom interviews for a search like nonstop. So I'm a little bit like zoomed out, but um, anyway. Well, you want to go on to the next question? It's fine. Yeah, anyway, and, and what part of what I do is try to imagine history like told from the perspective of the people who walk under those monuments all, all the time, right? And and that's what I try to do. So I don't know. That's fine. I lost my train of thought there. That's, uh, that's fine. Yeah. You're, forg you're forgiven. It's not so I don't know. So, I mean, Manuel, I'd be curious to think what, 
if I can ask a question, a brief question oh. back, what, how do you think it'll be received in future? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, that might well answer. But in the meantime, while he's thinking about yeah. it, uh, there's you may not have read it yet either, so it's not fair. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, here's a, a question. Uh, let's see, it's Jesus, isn't it? Uh, with regard to the quote unquote exemplary power of the United States in Cuba, can you attempt to put a date when that started? We see that clearly in the 1830s, 1840s, but can you see that happening during an earlier period? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's, um, I mean, definitely in the during the the period of the of the Monroe Doctrine, the question of the U.S. and its relationship to Cuba and its power in Cuba is already uh, is already really clear. The fact that um, Spain, in the context of Latin American independence, right, when as more and more Latin American countries are becoming independent, and Spain is eager to keep Cuba, uh, both to both to keep Cuba because it's by then becoming the world's largest producer of sugar, but also because it's a, a useful uh, staging ground uh, for military uh, expeditions against uh, Latin America, etc. Spain is eager to keep Cuba. So what it does is it allow, it allows free trade be between Cuba and North America in 1817, and that's a that's an that's a really important move that's going to shape. Uh, the character and the aspirations of the Cuban elite for a long time. So definitely by the early early 19th century, you can see that. You can see it going back. I mean, you know, Thomas Jefferson is talking about acquiring Cuba and attaching it to the U.S. And in one way or another. He doesn't specify whether a state or territory or what have you. But you know, in the 17 in the late 1780s. So um, yeah, so it goes back. It goes back um, further. Great. So Max has, is halfway through your book. He really likes the anecdotes uh, you've used. Uh, it's a long statement. Uh, and uh, he gives examples of them, the stories of Rene Mendez Capot, the three ones. And he says, he asks, what challenges, what challenges did you encounter when trying to piece together these narratives? What are the other methodological challenges you've encountered while writing, quote unquote, a people's history? Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't like I didn't figure it all out ahead of time. I just figured it out as I was writing and I didn't know what what the stories and what the examples will be. I mean, in some cases I knew ahead of time, but, you know, but um, but I didn't know until I was deep in the research and coming across these things and and I allowed myself to be surprised. So he refers to uh, the Rene Mendez Capote, who, you know, um, a young, uh, 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 who went on to become a, a Cuban writer, but she grew up in Medellin, you know, she was born um, in 1900 or 1901. And yeah, and just, just told the perspective of being, you know, that she has a memoir, she has several that, that I use for this, but one that was like, uh, memoria de una cubanita que nació con el siglo. So the memory of a young Cuban girl born with the century. So the idea of, of talking about Cuba um, emerging from Spanish colonialism and starting its career as a, as a republic and to tell that story from the perspective of a young girl, you know, that that's, it's, it just appealed to me. And then the fact that, which I was completely shocked by when I, when I read it, I, it's another one where you do a double take, that the, that the, that the, the, the builder, the master builder who built her house in Bedalo was actually a black veteran who then became uh, one of the two leaders of the, the so, you know, of the, of the independent party of color and the rebellion that came to be known as the race war of 1912. So, you know, it, it was just another one of those stories where it just let things come together in a way that was really exemplary and, and surprising and, and I hoped, you know, appealing and, and, and yeah, that would welcome or entice readers in. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, Daniel says, says uh, that, um, uh, your, of course, your book covers 500 years or so of Cuban history. Did you consider, he asked, going further back than that, or indeed, do you do so in some smaller ways? I do so in smaller ways. I feel like, you know, that there's all these things I left out of the, uh, in the, that are not in the book or that are not in the book to the extent that I would want in some ideal world. But, 
um, you know, I recently went back to the proposal I submitted to the publisher in which I kept referring to the book as short. <laughs> and then it became whatever 576 pages. So there, there's a lot that's not in it. I, I, I went back and forth between starting it before Columbus uh, or starting at a Columbus. The, the reason I decided <laughs> to start it with Columbus and then go back was for the reasons that I clarified that I that that I touched on when I talked about that chapter that by starting with Columbus and drawing the comparison to the way US history is narrated I bring in the question of US empire and the relationship between the two countries in a, in a way that I think surprises American readers so I decided to go with that but then what I did is in that chapter itself as I talk about the Spanish uh, you know in Cuba, then I went back to uh, indigenous culture and society and tried to, you know, do more with it in that, you know, later in that chapter. But I could have done more. So Manuel says he will talk to you later, but I mentioned that because Paul has built on that question to ask, how do you think your book will be received by Cuban Americans in Florida? Uh, I'm he says, I'm interested in any parallels between Cuban, between how Cuban Americans see discourse on Cuba with that of right of center American Jews view of discourse on Israel. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I feel like on the one hand, I think Cuban Americans, uh, I think, and, and right now it's only available in English. So I'm hearing from people who are reading it in English and can read in English, right? So. But I feel like many of them are starved for this kind of history. You know, they, they're depending on when they left Cuba, they they, they, they don't, you know, they, they have the, all these ideas of Cuba that they hear from their family or from relatives, but they don't really know that history. And so I feel like they're starved for it. And they're and so I'm hearing from a lot of people who are just saying they've learned a lot. That they really enjoyed it that they never knew i'm also there's i'm hearing from people who um don't agree with you know who who i think are more to the right of me uh politically but um and more to the left but those aren't tend to not be cuban americans but whatever more to the more to the right of me and what they do is they they really appreciate what's in the book and then a lot of them, and I'm saving them, actually, I've created an email folder for them. A lot of them are sending me personal family stories uh, in, a, in a way um, that I need, I think seek to, to bring me more to the right. And, but right now I'm just saving the stories. They're amazing family stories that I'm now developing a, a collection of. So they're, they're starving for knowing the history and they're also kind of eager to tell their own history. Oh. Yeah. That, the next book. Um, anyway, Magdalena says, do you think the ah, Cuban right. revolution could have survived without the restrictions on contact imposed by both countries? Um, you know, it's a counterfactual question, right? So there's no way to answer. There's, I mean, there's several ways one can answer. One is to question what, what the Cuban revolution means in that sentence, because to say, could the revolution, could the Cuban revolution have survived is to assume that it did survive, right? And, and part of what I try to do in the book is maybe trouble that a little bit, not to, not to have like a clear ending point of the Cuban revolution, but to emphasize uh, how it changed over time. I mean, it, it's it, to me, it's not, you know, it's not at all the, the government that's in Cuba today is a government that came out of the Cuban revolution, but I would not call it um, a revolutionary government. So that's that's one thing to to clarify. Another thing is, I do, I mean, I do think as the question I think suggests that American hostility uh, gave, gave Cuba a lot of, and gave the Cuban revolution a lot of prestige and a lot of credibility in the world. And, and, and they use that and, and the Cuban government used that to go to fact. There's also the question of the Cold War and the Soviet Union, right? That um, the Cuban revolution survived because it could turn at that point because it could turn to the Soviet Union in the face of, of US hostility. But I feel like US hostility just for the most part played right into the hands of the Cuban government. And there's a really famous anecdote um, story about Che Guevara being in a party, a birthday party in Uruguay for a Brazilian diplomat. And he has a secret meeting at 2 a.m. with 
um, Richard Goodwin, one of Kennedy's advisors. This was a few months after the Bay of Pigs. And basically, Che Guevara thanks Richard Goodwin for the Bay of Pigs and says, before this, we were an agreed little country. Now we're an equal. Thank you so much. We've consolidated, you know, you've helped us consolidate our power. And Richard Goodwin could think of, could think of nothing to say and just said, you're welcome. You know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. How interesting. How interesting. Yeah. Um, Kate says, Kate Quinn says, uh, she loves the, that you deconstruct the ubiquitous, ubiquitous. What's happening here? You're, you're, she's talking about the phrase, yeah, the triumph yeah. of revolution, uh, that we so often read without thinking about it. Yeah. Um, have you managed to trace how quickly, she says, that phrase came into common usage in yeah. Cuba, uh, you know, within days, weeks, months? It def definitely, she says, says something about the ways in which complex histories can get frozen into a yeah. singular narrative. Right. Yeah. Was there, wait, are you frozen? Question, well, the question was, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, have you managed to trace how quickly the, that phrase came into common usage in Cuba? The, oh, the triumph no, of the it's, a, it's a great question. That would make a great paper for a student to do or for, I mean, for, for any of us to do, right? But I haven't, I haven't done it, but it's a, um, it's a great, and I actually did, I mean, I said that here uh, in talking to you, I didn't end up in, I, that was going to be in the book at one point, and then it, I forgot to include it at the end. So, uh, so I didn't actually talk about, um, talk about that, that in the book, the, 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 the phrase. Okay. And Horace says, I know you're looking back five centuries, but I'm fascinated by your observation, quote, history is up for grabs. To put this all as briefly as possible, though can you imagine that in the middle of a rare rare global pandemic in which despite and perhaps because of its isolation cube is proved cuba is proving self-sufficient in vaccines the history may be more dynamic than ever <clears throat> yeah i mean um yeah no the vaccine story is incredible there's there's um and really important and um, and, and important to, to emphasize. Um, and that's, you know, I try to keep things like that in, in play in the book. So in when, you know, when I'm talking in the end, I want to come back to the histories of the graphs thing, but in the end, when I when I am when I'm talking about the those monuments and the Teodoro Ramos Blanco, his name just came to me. Okay, when I'm when I'm talking about the sculptors. Monuments, he does monuments to heroes like Maceo and Mati and, and, and so on, but he does these sculptures that are of anonymous people. And, and he himself is black and many of the, of, the, of the figures, the anonymous figures he writes about are also black. So they're, you know, they'll be like, a, the, there's one sculpture in the Museo de Bellas Artes, Nacional de Bellas Artes in Havana that's called Vida Interior interior life and it's the head in white marble of a black woman and so i i talk in the book about that about that sculpture and imagining who that might be right and and it could be a cuban doctor going off to you know to africa to treat ebola i didn't go to that yet you know, to the vaccines but it could be someone a woman pondering getting on a raft the next day right they're both part of the story they're both products of the cuban revolution in some sense uh and i think no there cannot be a history of the Cuban Revolution that doesn't keep both those women in in the narrative. So I just want to say that. And in terms of history is up for grabs, I feel like right like history in a sense is always up for grabs. But I feel it. I mean, those of us who live in the U.S. and are watching what's going on with the 1619 project, with new debates about Reconstruction now, right? That 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 history is mattering in public debate in in a way that that. You know, I mean, it, it, I think it ebbs and flows, and we're at a point now where it really, really matters. I think because the present feels so uncertain, and I think um, for for Cuba, there's the potential for that to happen as well. In part because, and I see it when people are talking about the 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 protests, um, and even actually some, you know, and they're talking about 62 years of this and 62 years of that. In some sense, what they're doing is they're re-narrating the origin of the Cuban Revolution. And that to some feels like an important project right now. And um, 
this in the same way there's also debate about what you know because the present is so uncertain and so politically polarized right now there's also a debate about what the cuban republic was uh and you know so so i do think that that history does feel up for grabs right now in a way that uh, feels unusual to me mm -hmm. well i think we're we're slowly winding down we've put you through uh, your paces but i did i did want to ask something before we finish, um, which when uh, the story of the Cuban missile, your story of the Cuban missile crisis in that particular village uh, and the accounts of those people and those palm trees that they saw, which, was, yeah. which were of course not palm trees. So that's that's a terrific uh, anecdote, anecdote, if you want to call it that, a particular story, but very important. And the question is, is there any way to know how they subsequently felt about all this when the whole thing came out and what was really going on. Uh, we probably don't have that kind of evidence or perhaps we no. do. No. no, I mean, we might, I don't know. I mean, I got yeah. that work from, um, there's a, a team in, um, oh God, where are they? Um, in Denmark or Norway, Norway. Uh, it's a joint, I think, uh, Norwegian and Cuban team that does all this, his, you know, they do archaeological research on the on recent history. And so they've done all this archaeological work on the missiles, on the Cuban missile sites, on the uh -huh. Soviet missile sites in Cuba. Really fascinating work. And they've done interviews with residents in the town. So I relied on that work and, of course, cited that work uh, in the chapters. So, um, no, I found a few letters, um, you know, in, in other places where people talked about how quickly the, you know, those 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 young soldiers disappeared. But, but no, it would be uh, an important thing to to research. Great, interesting thing to research. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think the, the there was also a comment, a very positive comment about the talk, and I, I have to say that I share it. I think uh, you've you've explored the topic, but also um, I think you. Uh, made your book come very much alive, and um, and the questions I think uh, really reflect that. So I think um, I think uh, of course it's published in the states, but I, I I'm sure it will be available here. And uh, so somebody else, somebody said, oh wait a minute, there's an, I was about to close it, but there's another question which I guess we should at least uh, try ask you to deal with. Let's see from from Lishar. Could you speak a bit more about the custom you mentioned of the indigenous people of the Bay burying their dead with their feet towards the east? Yeah, government I shelf? mean, that's all I know. It's something that came up in passing in an old, old history of Cuba from like the 1920s. Yeah. And, you know. The, the and, person, sorry, please. Yeah. So so I don't have much. I don't have anything beyond that. No. Well, uh, Lishar goes on yeah. to talk about. Right. Be, yeah. you know, as a kind of uh, notion in Judaism yeah. and conversos and did you, you, obviously this is not something that um, you, she's, it's a good question, but it's not something you ha have explored further. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So anyway, I, I think that with that point, I think that, that um, it's, it's of course great to see you. Good and to good, see you. Good night, and thank night. you all for, thank you all for coming. Uh, yeah. Hi, Jean. I mean, I'm sorry that we haven't seen you recently. <laughs> At the ACH, of course, we can't go to the ACH. Yeah, so yeah I know so, exactly. So that that that, that is at some at some point. I don't even know when or where the next one is. If I do know, I one. do know uh, because it's in Jamaica, and I had planned to go, yeah. but it's but it's online. Uh, oh. which is uh, if you ask my opinion, it's a bit early to go online. But as of the yeah. last week, maybe that's the right call. Um, yeah. But there are thanks from various people in 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 the chat. There's certainly thanks from me, uh, and 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 for and for the organizers. I think this is really great. And you've done a very good job of, uh, you know of exploring your book, and I think people will be really interested in getting a hold of it and reading it for great. all kinds, all the reasons you said. So. Great. Yeah. really really well done and uh i hope that we'll on a personal level we'll get to see you sometime soon um but thanks very much for this evening that's that's well, london I mean. anyway so, yeah <laughs> okay. of course of course when it's possible to travel yeah whenever, whenever. a round of applause anyway thank <laughs> yeah. you thank you all yeah so, bye -bye. so we'll yeah i'm sure we'll be in touch with ada okay, we'll be thanks. In touch. bye bye bye